the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel today was taken from Matthew, but I'm actually going to talk about a parallel Gospel that's from the Gospel of Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very much alike. Uh, theologically, theologians call them the synoptic Gospels. That means, in Greek, sin is, is with and optic, like, like optical eye. So they all see with one eye, sort of. Um, you might wonder why there's four Gospels. Well, it's like, imagine if there were a traffic accident and a policeman's trying to figure out what happened. Well, you get four different eyewitnesses and each one saw it a different way. But you kind of put it together and you have a... Uh, in, instead of a one-dimensional story, you have three-dimensional, or four-dimensional in this case. So you actually have a clear picture of different aspects. But in the Gospel of Mark, which is a parallel passage, it has a few other things, and the comments from the fathers are more profound. So I wanted to share those with you. This is after the transfiguration of Mount Tabor, when our Lord was transfigured into life. And if you remember, he only had three of his apostles with him at that time. Peter, James, and John. And then when he came down to the multitudes from there, he found the other nine apostles. And they were being besieged by the multitudes because they couldn't find Jesus. And they were asking for miracles of healing. They were asking for demons to be cast out. They were asking the questions. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to trip them up, embarrass them in front of the people. And our Lord arrives. And then one in the crowd spoke up and said, Master, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, asking them to cast it out, but they could not. So a man in the crowd had very weak faith. It shows his weakness of faith, the fact, first of all, that even our Lord says, O faithless generation. Uh, and then he says in the other passage of Matthew that to him who believes all things are possible. And this man himself attests to his weak faith when he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. That this man complains about his disciples. He says, they, I brought my son to them and they couldn't even cure him. He says this in front of the multitudes to embarrass Christ, to embarrass the apostles. It shows his weakness of faith, how little he fears God, and how much he's demanding and offering so little. So Jesus answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring the boy to me. And when they brought him to Jesus, and when he saw him, Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell to the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth, and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, since childhood, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you could do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people were starting to gather and the multitudes were coming, rather than wait for them, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. The man who approached the Lord and accused the disciples of not having the power to heal shows his lack of faith. But the Lord turns the tables, and he puts the blame squarely on. It's as if he says, it is your unbelief which is the cause of your sons not being healed, not my apostles. The Lord does not only address this man, but all the Sadducees and the Pharisees and those of his Jewish brothers who did not accept him as the Messiah. 
who were always questioning him and trying to trip him up. And it is likely that many of those who were standing by were also scandalized by the fact that the apostle didn't seem to be able to cast his demon out. But our Lord does not reproach them. He grants healing to the boy. He rebukes the spirit and says, Come out of him and enter him no more. The fathers say that this suggests that because of the man's unbelief, the demon would have gone back into the boy, unless our Lord added and entered him no more. A man is thrown by a demon into the fire of anger and desire and the passions that separate us from God. And into water, meaning the pounding surf and the turbulent waves of worldly cares. That's how the church fathers see this. That it's more than just fire and water in a material sense, but they stand for things. There's all this talk all the time of trying to be free of the passions. I've said many times in English, passion can be a positive word. You know, he has a passion for, for this uh, wonderful cause of helping animals. He has a passion for this, a passion for literature, a passion for art. That's not the kind of passion we're talking about. In Greek, a passion is an, as a passive, that you don't stand your ground for the Lord but you blow with the winds of this world, letting the world blow you around like dry leaves because you're passive and you're not being manly and standing your ground to keep the Lord's commandments. So the demon, in this case, you should remember that when you see demons in the movies, in Hollywood movies, that's not what we're talking about. Demon in Greek means a force. That's all it means. When Socrates stood trial 400 years before Christ in Athens, mm -hmm. and he was explaining himself to the people of Athens, he used the word demon in a neutral sense. It didn't have a negative connotation in those days. He said, and this force came to me, and this force came to me and told me to ask questions, to question you know, our pagan faith, to question with reason, are we on the right track? He's called one of the holy pagans by the fathers of the church. But he used the word demon positively. The word demon only became negative for the early Christians, who saw that these fallen angels actually would inhabit idols and would mislead people with their lies and all these pagan beliefs. That's when demon took a negative context. Our Lord promised his apostles that they would have the power to cast out demons. And they did. Earlier in the Gospels, we hear the 70 apostles coming back. They sent them out two by two throughout the whole, the whole countryside. And they came back, Lord, we were able to cure the sick. We were able to cast out demons. We were able to do this. We were able to, everything you said is true. And then this happens. And they can't cast this demon out. The fire of anger and desire and the passions that separates from God and the water that like the pounding surf and turbulent waves, all that separate us from the Lord. Note that the demon is both mute and deaf. It is deaf because it doesn't want to hear the words of God, and it is mute because it is unable to teach others about God. But Jesus is the word of the gospel, and he takes the boy by the hand, and by taking his hand, he strengthens the boy's power to act, and for that man, his father, so that he will be free from the demon. See how God first helps us. He takes our hand. And then we ourselves are required to do our part, to make the effort to be virtuous and do the Lord's will. For the evangelist says in this sentence, first he says, Jesus lifted him up. This is the divine help. But then he says, and the boy arose. This is the effort of the boy himself. In orthodoxy, salvation is a synergy. It's a cooperation of God and man. 
Salvation can only be achieved by God's grace, but also if we do our part by accepting that grace and loving the Lord back and serving Him. So then, after all this miracle happened and the multitudes went away, the apostles privately, all downcast and depressed, asked Jesus, why could we not cast out this demon? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. The disciples were afraid that they had lost this great grace that the Lord had given to them, and it was no longer with them, this favor of the Lord to work these miracles. And this was why they had not been able to cast out the demon. But our Lord tells us that this kind has not come out except through prayer and fasting. The one suffering should fast, and the one performing the exorcism, so to speak, should also fast. Not only pray, but to fast, and not only fast, but to pray. The two were like wings, angels' wings that bring us to God. But by fasting, I don't necessarily mean just restrictions on food. Something very profound, I came across a wonderful quotation just a couple of days ago from St. Anatolia of Optina, a 19th century saint, a great monastic father, who said, the best fast is to endure all that God sends us. When things don't go right in our lives, when our health goes south, when we have financial losses, when those we love are distant from us, when things are not going well, to endure it with patience. And don't be like the man with the weak faith who said, I brought him to your apostles and they couldn't even do anything. And Lord, if you can do something, please heal my son. Let's not have that kind of arrogance. Let's be humble Orthodox Christians who wait upon the Lord and serve Him with all our heart. In the name of the Father and the Son. Amen.